Now, some of you may be aware that Rhonda and I like to visit vineyards. There really are some majestic looking ones with great views not that far from us. To look out over the rows of vines all manicured and well taken care of really is a sight to behold. Now the town we grew up in, Vineland, New Jersey, it got its name from the many wild grapevines that were found when it was settled. Some of you have heard the story that I've told that this is actually where Welch's grape juice started. That's how plentiful the grapes and the vines were when they first came in to settle the place. And all the time that I was growing up and playing in the woods, I don't remember ever seeing any wild grapevines. I never saw one. But here, man, we have some grapevines that are just out of control. Our property is full of these things. I, don't, I can't get rid of them. They're that, they're that plentiful. I mean, they'll grow up any tree and eventually take over and choke that tree and kill it. They are a far cry from the well-taken-care-of manicured vines at a vineyard, that's for sure. You see, when the grapes grow unattended, they start to put most of their energy into the vines growing and very little energy into their fruit. And as a result, the berries become small and bitter and full of seeds. They're practically unedible and unusable for anything good. <laughs> Bears, yeah. That's about it, feeding the wild animals. Well, today... Isaiah is going to tell us of a vineyard, its keeper, and its fate. So let's turn to the book of Isaiah. We're looking at chapter 5. It's on page 476 in the Pew Bibles, I believe. And we're going to be reading verses 1 to 7. So that's Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 to 7. It's on page 476 in the Pew Bible. And we'll read it responsively. I'll read verse 1, you read verse 2, and we'll go back and forth. So starting with verse 1 from chapter 5 of the book of, uh, book of Isaiah. Verse 1 says, I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. Read verse 2. Now you dwellers in Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. Read verse 4. Now I will tell you what I'm going to do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge and it will be destroyed. I will break down its wall and it will be trampled. Verse 6. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the nation of Israel, and the people of Judah are the vines he delighted in. And he looked for justice, but saw bloodshed, for righteousness, but heard cries of distress. Pray with me. God of communication, we know that grapes don't grow wild and out of control in your vineyards. Forgive us when we trample your beautiful land or destroy others' feelings with our actions. Help us to stand up for those who are hurting and treated unfairly. Father, speak to us today and reveal the message we need to hear from you this day. So open our eyes and our ears and soften our hearts and our minds and allow me to step back so your message can come forward. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So if you thought that Isaiah was difficult last week, this week he's going to be impossible. 
And he calls this a love song. Plus, Israel saw itself as the vineyard. And later, the church began to see itself as the new vineyard. And this vineyard is targeted for destruction in this text. I mean, it's really hard to find any, it's hard to find a positive spin to put on this, to make it sound like it's going to be okay. I mean, God's telling Isaiah that he's going to take away the walls and the hedges that protect the vineyard and let it be trampled and devoured by whomever or whatever comes along. And this is a love song. A key verse out of this is verse 3. Dwellers in Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. You see, we love our churches. We put forth a lot of effort to maintain the buildings and to fill them with ministries and events and fellowship and services. We spend a lot of time here. We love our church, and we should. But what Isaiah is asking us is, do we sometimes lose perspective when it comes to the church, God's vineyard? I mean, what is the church really for? What is the church for? Because supporting the church is not supposed to be an end in itself. Our church mission statement is people mentoring people for Christ, not mentoring people for the church. Not to lead people to the church, but to lead them to a relationship with Christ. The church is the means, not the end of what we do. Now, we've started some really great things to reach out beyond the walls of this building and to minister to the community around us. We've committed to help and support local ministries. We've started conversations with non-church people and have been showing them the love of God through our actions. We've been realizing that the church is wherever you, the congregation, is. And the church does whatever it is each of you do. And this is where things get scary. Now, as I mentioned earlier, vineyards are aesthetically beautiful places. They have beautiful greenery, well-manicured lawns, and rows of grapevines that are exquisite and breathtaking. The rolling hills are just marvelous to see. Now, in biblical days, a vineyard was a prized possession. They were well taken care of. It actually took a great deal to take care of them. There was always the nurturing of the grapes or whatever fruit was being featured. This tending to the vineyard was all orchestrated for one thing and one thing only. And that was grapes. Fresh, whole, round, perfect grapes. And workers in the vineyard were meticulous and detailed in their care for those grapes. However, God speaks of these grapes gone wild. And there's no excuse for the wild grapes. They've been watered and given good shade so as not to be parched by the sun. They've been given the best environment for growth. So it's not adding up. Why has God's vineyard, a beautiful masterpiece, somehow led to the production of wild grapes? Those small bitter, filled with seed gra- seeds, grapes. See, these grapes were not sufficient. They weren't healthy or wholesome for their intended use. Today, many believers' vineyards are their buildings. And big churches, in some cases. Sanctuaries with major lighting and technology packages and cafes and eateries to make one's visit there entertaining. I mean, the visuals can be breathtaking and clearly the buildings are well cared for. We have, we have at least 15 active churches in this valley. And there are approximately 4,300 people in this valley. 
If you go down and include Westfield, that number jumps to 5,700 people in the valley. So not counting Westfield, that's over 280 people per church. Now, if we take the national average of 10% of the people who aren't interested in church at all away, we still have 250 people per church in this valley. And the problem is that many of the churches are working so hard to keep their building open that they don't have time to reach out to those 250 people. Oh, they have enough money to keep their building open, but their vines have turned wild because they're focusing on the wrong vine tender. Now, please, don't get me wrong. We need open churches to minister in the different communities, but with all of these vineyards, how can this world still be struggling with issues of deep oppression, Massive health care needs, racism in housing markets, ageism, misogyny, xenophobia, and nationalism. How can this be with so many vineyards in our midst? Could it be that they are yielding wild grapes? And the formula for getting all this corrected, the formula for turning these wild grapes back into plump, sweet, luscious grapes remains the same repentance. There's nothing wrong with great vineyards, but that's only a little bit of what it means to be a people connected to their God. Now, remember when I said that the church is wherever you, the congregation, is, and the church does whatever each of you is doing, and I said that that was scary? Well, it's scary because if we're not careful, we could end up being wild grapes for the opposite reason of those churches who do nothing. We could get so wrapped up and involved in doing ministry work that we make that work our vineyard and we lose sight of why we're doing that work, which is to show God's love to others and to tell them of that love, to show them a relationship with Christ in such a way that they they then crave that same relationship and they want it. They want what we have. You see, wild grapes, according to Isaiah, means that the people of God were following no leadership but their own will and conscience. God wants us to be cultivated grapes, guided by the Word, and and tended by the Spirit wherever we live and work. Now, while we are thankful for the church buildings, for the beauty and the unity of these structures, it's the people and how they live in the world that are the church at work. It's you, each living every other day of the week, that is the church at work in the world. It's great to have this building. We need to upkeep this building, but we have to remember that this building is just a tool. If this building went away, each of us here would still be the church in this community. And that's the important thing for us to keep in mind. You are the church. We are the church. Let's pray. God of righteousness, the Holy Spirit continues to seek and empower believers that they might live fruitful lives of righteousness. Help us to be fertile ground where the Word of God will take deep root within our lives that others might experience a glimpse of your glory through us. May your church be outposts of healing and grace for those in need. May we be a well-nurtured, well-fed, well-cared-for vineyard that keeps you in the center of all that we do. May we never lose sight of the fact that all our actions should be to lead people into a relationship with you. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our risen Savior. Amen.